Now we'll move into the 1880s. So first we have a woman's waistcoat with a black silk bodice and a brown linen under bodice. The lace on the collar and the cuffs and on the sleeves and they're smocking at the waist. Again, the lace would have been handmade. We're gonna see some pieces with applique. Soon all of that was handmade. Next we have a cotton damask capelet with polished cotton underlining and a square sectional column, collar. It's just a beautiful piece. And all of this clothing is really in phenomenal condition. Next we have a morning coat. It's tucked from top to bottom. When we were unpacking this, we realized that it was unfinished. And one of the reasons we knew that was because we found the needle and thread still tucked in where the shoulder had not quite been completed on the seam. <laughs> yeah, it's almost unbelievable. It has crochet lace inserts at the cuffs. Good luck finding something that is tucked from top to bottom today because I have tried and it's almost impossible. Next, we have a pigeon front blouse with a stitched down tuck detail at the yoke. Again, this is 1880, maybe even as late as 1900. Now we'll move into the 1890s. So first we have a white cotton petticoat with lace trim flounce with a silk ribbon detail. Next, we have a late Victorian style apron with a very delicate machine embroidered insertion. That's down here at the very bottom of the um, apron. And last, we have a cotton chemise off the shoulders with cutwork eyelets and crochet tattering. And it's spotless, I have to say. It's really incredible. Next, we have a black bodice with tuck detail and applique work. This is made from a wool calais. Am I saying that right? Calais? Um, it's really hard in these slides to see the detail, but there's an applique pattern that's running all the way up the top to the bottom. Next, This is a black wool bodice with an under bodice of polished cotton. It has a pigeon front and hand stitched applique. The centerpiece here has little eyelets and hooks and it hooks into place to give it kind of that tailored look. And then the, the pigeon fronting is almost like a dicky, if you will. And then it hooks in the back as well. Here you can see that same top with a wool serge walking skirt. It's a black polished cotton lining. Don't know if these pieces actually went together or not. It's kind of hard to know. Next we have a wool calais petticoat with a tiered ruffles. Now when I was photographing this collection, one of the problems I ran into is that these um, dresses, one, they're incredibly small and uh, some of them I had difficulty uh, even getting them on the dress form I had and secondly, once I did get them on, they didn't hang right and it took me a while to figure out I needed a bustle and so I took tissue paper and I created my own little bustle and we taped it to the mannequin so that we could get the nice flow of the material that we needed. My director said she would not buy me a bustle. <laughs> but I did figure out a way to make one, so it all worked out in the end. Uh, next is a, a wool calais jacket with oriental stitching, a shawl capelet detail, black fizzle appliques down the front, and the cape with uh, tassel trims. So here you can see there's tassels running down the applique in the front, as well as coming off the cuffs, uh, the capelet, 
as well as the front bodice piece all have the applique work, heavy oriental influence obviously in that piece. Um, definitely around 1890 for a piece like that. Next we have a 10 inch sewn down pleats of a black Calais wool underskirt with train. It creates a bell-like silhouette, as you can see here. Uh, this item was interesting because when we looked at it, we realized it had been mended several times. You can see, well, it doesn't show too well here, but you can see there's some stitching on these folds as well. This piece had been taken in and let out several times. So again, you see the value that was put into this clothing and the care that was taken. In itself, it tells you a little bit about this family just by looking at that kind of thing. Next, we have a black wool petticoat with a gathered waist, a ruffle flounce with a background backed dust ruffle. Say that three times fast. Um, this also has been tucked to be shortened at one time. I might have even had a train. Next to it is a black satin underskirt with ruffles on the bottom. Now you'll notice I say black and a lot of times it looks kind of green. And a lot of that has to do with the fading. Although these materials were kept in really nice circumstances, um, they were folded, they weren't, uh, you know, properly tissue papered, but they were taken out every year and aired and put away, so that's why they're in such good condition, but you still have some fading of the dyes, mostly due to humidity and temperature changes. Next we have a white linen waist double breasted blouse, hand embroidered collar, cuffs, and the edge of the waist. It has puffed sleeves. So here you can see the scalloping on the collar. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. There you can see it in the front. Oh, it's going to disappear. So there's supposed to be another picture. We're supposed to see the front again. Ah, oh, there it is. So you can really see the detail on the bottom and the cuffs and the collar. And there's some. Um, embroidery as well on the collar. Oh yes. So here we have a beaver capelet with a stand-up collar. And it would have been meant to be worn with the collar straight up like that. You would not have folded it. Back here are little acorns. Not sure what that has to do with beavers, but whatever. <laughs> That's what's on the back there. Oh, this is a beautiful piece. So this is a seal neck piece, 1890-1900. Next to it is a mink shoulder piece with a full capelet over the shoulders. I'm made to understand that means the way it drapes all the way down. This piece though, for those of you who are Downton Abbey fans, could you not see the matriarch wearing a piece like this? Absolutely. Next, we have a black waistcoat, waistcoat of cotton satin. The buttonholes are stitched with scallops um, and trim is on the collar and trimmed on the collar as well, the cuffs and the front opening. Yeah, it's really hard to see in this picture. And that's another problem with a lot of this late 1800s clothing. It's all black and it just doesn't show up very well. Um, the buttons are jet black beads. It has a soft gather at the shoulders and the cuffs. Also, it seems to, oops, seems to make the arms are really long on a lot of these um, outfits we're going to see, or blouses. Oh, so this is a black capelet. Okay, I'm going to so butcher this. With a soutache lace in three layers, it's the best I can do. Um, beautiful piece. There's another lace scarf, crochet scarf, that uh, Sean Jensen was pretty sure would have been worn underneath it. And it was a rectangular scarf, and it would have just hung down right in the front. 
Um, this piece right now is uh, on loan at the Wright's house. So you can see this at the Wright's house. There's another piece or two as well that you're going to see today that right now are on loan at the Wright's. So now we'll move into the 1900s and 1910s. We're going to start with a 10 inch black rectangular Kelly wool shawl with black fringe. I just can't emphasize enough how wonderful this material is and how sharp and clean and the way it just keeps its beautiful shape. Next, oh yeah, so we have a white apron with a wide border of hand crocheted lace. Next, we have another white cotton long apron. Um, this has a machine embroidered trim though at the hem. And then here is a wonderful black lace scarf that you would have worn as an accent. Um, as you can tell how beautiful these aprons are, these were certainly not aprons that you wore in the kitchen. These are aprons that you would have worn when visitors were coming to your house, when you were, it, it would have been more of a dress item than a utilitarian item. Next, we have a gray rayon with black Thaley collar. It's blue and green embroidery stitch, and the buttons are of a black glass etched in silver probably 1905 to 1910. I actually have this kind of on exhibit in the archives right now. Uh, the next piece, everyone's gonna love this because it's just beautiful. So here we have a green silk piano shawl. It has pink, lavender, and orange embroidery. It has a beige silk 16 inch knotted fringe. Just absolutely beautiful. It's really hard to date these because these actually stayed popular up through the 20s and the 30s and there was even a little bit of a revival of them in the 50s. Um, but we're pretty sure this probably dates back more around 1910. Uh, here we have more of a utilitarian apron. So this is a black and white pinstriped apron. It's trimmed with a black rickrack and has black ties that are darted for shape, or it's darted for shape, sorry. I think that's referring to this up here. Next to it, we have an Edwardian style apron. It's made of cream linen with embroidered scallops and cross stitching and tr on the trim. This is estimated to be a size two. Um, I love all this clothing. I wish I was a size two, because I just, you know, would play dress up. Uh, but notice the way this kind of comes around the shoulders in the back and then it buttons um, underneath in the front. So you have this nice smooth apron in the front, um, but it's very secure. It's not going to bounce around while you're canning and doing all that other vigorous work. Next we have a woman's Edwardian blouse. It's rayon. It's heavily embroidered with lace inset and collar with a dolman sleeves. The heavy cotton satin thread was used to weave in and out of the net fabric of the waist. So, oh, down here, you have really, really he extraordinarily heavy silk thread. All right, 1910 to 1920s. <laughs> This is really one of my favorite pieces. So this is a green and black stripes with ribbon dress and a matching sash. It has French knots and silk covered buttons and a tabid skirt. 1915 to 1919. Uh, it's a two piece outfit with a belt. And uh, this is also on display right now at the Wright's home. They wanted to do a summer theme. Next, we have a two-piece dress with slip, a black underslip, and a black silk chiffon long sleeve dress with cut work bib on the front and the back, and it has laced trim. 
trim on the um, Kim and the cuffs. Next, we have an off-white uh, cotton day dress with a peplum overlay and tucked shirt with sash. Has tatting insets and trim on the collar and cuffs. This piece is also currently at the Wright's home. It's a beautiful piece. And if you ever think about the photographs you see of the picnics and the ladies all in the white dresses and the men are all in their dark suits, and this is exactly the kind of dress that I would have envisioned them wearing on a day out to go to the old dam in New Harmony. I mean, you could just see that. Uh, now I've lost my place. Oh. Oh, yeah. So here we have a silk taffeta evening dress, red bows on the shoulders and neck, and a petaled peplum tiered skirt. So this is probably 1919 into the 1920s. Each one of these petals is individually sewn on. These are not like layers. Each one is sewn on. And it just looks like fun, doesn't it? Next, we have a black, no, yes, it is black, a black ray, rayon cape. Um, this piece had some uh, dry rotting on the interior. You can almost see it. It's a light beige color. It's a, it's a polished cotton as well. But the exterior of this is still in wonderful condition. All of the stitching is intact, and you can see the layering there on the cape has a very dramatic effect. Next, we have an Edwardian blouse of cream-colored tissue cotton. I don't know if I've ever heard of tissue cotton. It's a stripe on stripe with front ties and French knots. That's the one here on the far side. You can see the striping pattern there. In the center, we have a shade stripe lawn cotton blouse with light blue French knots, faggoting detail on the placket and the cuffs. So down here and uh, I'm not sure where the placket is. And then on this side we have an Edwardian style shirt waist. It's made of white rice or again tissue cotton. Um, there's a note about this that the handmade tatting set in the sleeves, oh, I'm sorry, that there is handmade tatting set in the sleeves and trim on the cuffs and the collar. So here we have that tatting uh, inset into the cuffs and at the edge as well as on the collar. And it is, has an elastic band. So now we'll move into the 1920s. We'll start with a beautiful red silk chiffon dress with a matching red silk slip. The dress has smocking at the hip line with a tiered ruffle skirt. Next, we have a two-piece black crepe chiffon dress with crepe Ryan, un Ryan, sorry, Ryan underdress in black and peach tones. It has a rhinestone buckle on the belt and a handkerchief hem see the jagged hem. And then we have a black and cream rayon dress with orange piping. It's smocking on the hips and a capelet collar. So there's the collar. You can see the way that the waist droops. And uh, it does have beautiful orange piping on it. Next, we have a print rayon dress with a drop waist. This is probably more late 20s, over here. And then next, we have a lovely red crepe de, chien, uh, crepe de chine skirt and cape. Um, it's a pleated skirt with a pleated ruffle cape, faggoting on the seams of the cape, so there's some deterioration. Um, flower detail on the neck of the cape and the side of the waist. So you can see the flower here and here. And it, they probably matched it one time, but we're pretty sure this one got replaced somewhere along the line. 
Next, we have a black silk Chanel suit. It has light brown embroidery borders on the bottom of an elastic waisted skirt. And the jacket as well has the same embroidery pattern. It has black fur trims on the neckline and cuffs. And the jacket is fully lined with satin. Oh, quit. So that would be this piece over here. Again, just a beautiful piece. And then next to it is a cream linen cotton day dress with peach linen, linen detail and kick pleats. Kick pleats are down here at the bottom. Oh, so now we'll have some fun. Um, we have a woman's black and green wool swimsuit from the 1920s. Who wants to go swimming in that? And, you know, my assistant pointed out to me the other day when she was looking some things out, not only would you have worn this entire getup, but you would have worn wool leggings, too. Want to go take a dip in the Ohio? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, next we're going to have, this is a lot of fun. It's almost impossible to date what I'm about to show you. But given many of the styles, we're pretty confident that it's probably 1920s, 1930s. These are all handmade. They're adorable. So first we have a brown wool with red trim knit toboggan, toboggan hat. It's up here in the corner. Then we have a brown wool. Oh, I already said that one. Oh, aqua wool. This one over here with a lovely little swirl pattern on top. Then we have a wine wool with the like knots. They're not quite French knots because um, they're much larger than a French knot, uh, but it, it's got a wonderful effect. And then, of course, we have two little red ones here as well. Now, when you look at these, they look like they're awfully small hats. You can see this one's barely wanting to fit on one of my heads. Um, but we are fairly confident these are not kids' hats. These are probably women's hats. Possibly this one could be a kid's hat and this one, but we're pretty sure the other ones are not. Very small people. Okay, so next, because we can't leave the Roaring Twenties without a little bit of bling, right? <laughs> so here we have a white lace with white teardrop-shaped sequence top. So this is probably in the state of being taken apart. Evadine's pretty sure that this had an entire dress at one time. And that this is, we are seeing it in the state of, of taking it down to repurpose it into something else. But would that not be fun? I mean, come on. Who wouldn't enjoy wearing something like that at least once? I would. Okay, so now we're going to move into the 1930s. We're going to start with a brown and with beige trim crochet dress. Probably about a size 6. Again, yeah, very small. We have a shirt waist dress, black, orange, and yellow on this side. Very bold for the 30s. There we go. And then we have a, this could be fox or stone marten neck piece. And yes, everything's intact on the critter. Um, yeah, I know. The claws and it's, you know. Um, it's still a really cool piece. I know it sounds a little ugh, but it, it's actually pretty neat. And the students love it when I get it out and they look at it. And I, I digress. Uh, next, we have a lavender bias cut evening dress with smocked detail at the top and short bishop sleeves. Is that just not like something that walked out of the movie set from the 1930s? This is a, also a beautiful. Um, skirt and top. It's Art Deco geometric pattern on a bias cut with a drop waist and the belt. Love those geometric patterns. And here again we have a green crochet dress with belt. Two tones of green in the detail. This belt is not oh so more faded than the rest of the dress. It was meant to be a different shade. Also notice the collar. It was meant to be off-center. It's a little bit of feeding into that Art Deco and uh, the coming of the arts and crafts movement. So trying to kind of play with proportions. 
Oh, this is a beautiful piece. This is a beige wool coat with a fur collar uh, that has diagonal tucks that cover three-fourths of the, the uh, coat. It continues along to the front. It has one large gray pearl button, wide cuffs on the sleeve. But is that just not so striking? I mean, even today, I think a coat like this would just be stunning. Next, we have a two-piece sweater and skirt. It's a copper knit with some trumpeting flare on the skirt. It also has some ribbed striping um, in the knit pattern. It's, a, again, an Art Deco detail. You can't really see it in here in the picture, but it's kind of a rickrack pattern that goes down the, uh, the knit. Next, we have a rose-colored cardigan with wooden beads and a matching tam, although the tam is not pictured. We have a wine-colored example over here on the far side. We're estimating all of these from the same time period. And then here's a lovely example from uh, in black. Uh, sometimes when I show this, people are tempted to think that this is a 1960s thing. Um, no, these actually, these kinds of styles go way back and the hippies did not originate them. No, they stole them just like we steal our fashion from times past all the time, all right? Thank goodness some stuff comes back. Too bad others does. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so now we're going to move into the 1940s. What working woman wouldn't want a nice print dress? with a gathered yoke shoulder line and an A-line shaped skirt with five panels. It just uh, be stunning, impress the boss. Next, we have a black crepe um, suit. This is the top only shown here. I do have the pants that go with it. Notice the nice little rhinestone decoration. Detail and the side tied belt. And we have a wonderful example of a red slip. And you may ask yourself, well, so, we've seen slips before. This is when color really starts to come to women's undergarments. The late 30s and the 40s and was when we start to have fun. We're able to express ourselves. So while we can't really date this necessarily to the 1940s, I put it here because it's an example of the changes that are starting to take place in fashion for women. Partly because women start designing stuff instead of men. That helps. <laughs> this is a beautiful piece. This is a black crepe two-piece dress and jacket. It has little white bows on the print. So you have an outer jacket and then the inner dress. So now we'll move into the 50s. This is a two-piece gray wool suit with lace trim bodice. This is a Paul Parnese. He was a local designer. Some of these pieces are going to be designer pieces from here on out. And then next, it just wouldn't be complete. You have to have a two-piece gray wool suit with also your lace trim. Wait a minute, did I get out of wax somewhere? Sorry, wait a minute. That's the black chiffon crepe cocktail dress with long sleeves and the lace bodice. I'm sorry, this is a Don Loper original. I think I skipped ahead. This is the two-piece gray wool suit with lace trim on the bodice. This is the Paul Parnes. I think it's very classic 50s as well. So now we'll move into the 60s. And no wardrobe would be complete without a short chartreuse floral dress. Um, my mother had one. I know lots of people did. It just, this is a Donnell Brooks label from the 1950s. It just, it, it just screams at you. Um, next, we'll move into the 70s. Yeah, I don't have much from the later years, but I got a little bit. Um, so here we have a two-piece dress with matching jacket. It's in purple. And this is the beginning of acrylic material. Do, 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 do. <laughs> it gets worse. 
<laughs> Next is a pink polyester, long sleeved, full length dress. Now I have to say that the shape of this dress and the design, it is really beautiful. But I have to say this picture looks a lot better than in person. This is the most hideous pink I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. This is like Pipto Bismol kind of pink. It is. It is. It's, it's really, it's really bad. It's re this looks good compared to how it really looks. And then next, of course, it wouldn't be complete without some maxi dresses. So we have an aqua blue, yellow, and salmon floral full length polyester maxi dress with cut work at the neckline. This one. And we have a long sleeved polyester navy print full length dress with high waisted uh, navy kit trim around neck and waist with a bow. Yeah, we all know these were around too. We all worried about them melting in the dryer. We remember those days. I, I know my mom had that. Uh, now, next, I just want to show you some cute items out of the collection. They don't neatly fit into any of my time categories. This is a baby shawl. It's a circular shawl. Shawl. Um, here you can see the back of it. So when you lay this out, it's a perfect circle. And it has a drawstring that goes across one quarter of it. And you pull the drawstring to create the collar and the rounding. It's a beautiful piece. Um, this is a, a short sleeve blouse, white, black, and orange, navy. We think that's probably 30s with the geometric design, although it could be 40s as well. In the center, this is just a lovely linen skirt with a hand embroidery that goes all the way around the bottom. And next, again, I guess this made me think of the 60s and the 70s again, although we can't really date it, um, but a gold tuxedo jacket. Um, again, something that's pretty iconic in a lot of pictures. And then over here we have a hand knitted, knitted purple wool sweater with belt and dicky, and it has a gray trim. So this is a dicky that uh, buttons on the inside of the sweater. And next to it we have what's probably from the 20s, or again could be the 30s, um, just a wonderful example of a uh, black satin underdress. Probably 1920. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions that anyone has. Uh, I would invite anyone to come out and see our collections or explore our websites. I'd really love for people to go on and look at the collections, the digital collections. You can leave comments. Um, I've had people who have found relatives pictures and they've left a comment, hey, that's so-and-so. Um, and we try to research those and update the files where we can. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. At minimal. Now I'm getting them out a lot for exhibits right now, which is great. But we already have thought long term, how are we going to maintain this collection? Um, the Indiana State Museum, they hang most of their collection. And hanging is bad. Um, but they hang it because so much of their stuff goes in and out so often that it's not hanging on a hanger for very long. And they also have very nice, specially made vaults for it. Um, but those of you who have collections at home, you're putting a lot of wear and tear on the seams to hang something, even if you have it padded. Ideally, I mean, if it's going to be hung, you need it well padded on the top of the hanger so that it's not resting on the hanger and it's not, um, you know, trying to fold. Did you have to steam any of this? The last time it went on display out on campus in the big display case, they were steamed. I have not steamed. As you can saw in some of my pictures, they were wrinkled because I didn't even have the equipment to steam them when I photographed them. Ideally, what I'd like to do is have it professionally photographed um, properly. Uh, and that time we would steam the pieces. We would not clean any of these pieces. Some of them do have stains. There are processes by which you can clean old clothing. It's very expensive and it takes um, a certain expertise that I certainly don't have. Um, but we will steam them and if, when they go on exhibit they generally get steamed before they're put on the, 
uh, form. Yeah, and I'm not sure, I think Wright's only has one of them actually on a mannequin. I think the others are just laying out. They steamed the one, but not the others. Any other questions? Well, well, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Butchering aside, I, you know. <laughs> this was the presentation of 100 Years of Vintage Clothing by Jennifer Green from the University of Southern Indiana. She's in charge of the archives and reference library at the University of Southern Indiana. This major part of this collection is listed here in Everdeen Garden Collection at USI Archives and Special Collections. We, have, we are very grateful for Everdeen Garden's collection. Also from the Beardsley Montgomery, but mostly from Everdeen Garden. These are several of the hats from the Evening Garden Collection. You see the beauty of these handmade hats. Just I'm absolutely surprised fabulous. Not here she came to the last one. She usually sits up front and corrects me. Bless her heart. No, I love it. I love it. I